still works. Hi, welcome back. Today we are talking about the work in chapter 9, which is transport in animals. So how does our body um, transport substances such as fluids and molecules around? Well, it does this by making use of our complex circulatory system. Our circulatory system is a network of blood vessels which transports blood throughout our bodies. Now, valves control the flow. How it works is... So blood normally flows in this direction. This is our blood vessel. And over here, we can see uh, the valves. These are our valve leaflets and they allow the blood to go through because as you see they are fold they fold open this way if blood tries to flow in the wrong direction which would be this way the blood will push up against these valves and this will result them to close and shut uh, that's not allowing blood to flow in this direction so we have what is known as a double circulatory system what that means is that blood is pumped through our heart twice um, to complete one circuit. Let's take a look at what that looks like. This is our double circulatory system. Blood flows into the right atrium. It flows, it goes to the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it's pumped to the lungs. Here blood is oxygenated and this oxygenated blood travels back to the heart, to the left atrium. It's pushed into the left ventricle where the left ventricle contracts and push this, the blood to the rest of the body. At the body, the blood gives off the oxygen. So oxygenated blood travels to the body. Our body takes up uh, oxygen from the blood. Then our deoxygenated blood returns back to the right side of the heart, to the right atrium goes to the right ventricle again and goes back to the lungs. So this is one circulate or one uh, cycle in our circulatory system. Now fish for example have a they don't have a double circulatory system. From the heart the blood is pumped to the gills where it's oxygenated. Here the oxygenated blood goes to the body where the body takes up the oxygen and deoxygenated blood travels back to the heart so blood passes through the heart only once on a cycle all right so here we've got our heart don't get overwhelmed by all of these labels you do not need to know them or I've underlined the ones in red which are the ones we will be looking at so let's talk about a, a cardiac cycle or how blood travels through the heart here we've got our right side of the heart and here we have our left side of the heart. You can see the wall of the left side of the ventricle is much thicker than the right side. You can see the size and this is one way in which you can determine which uh, side of the heart you're looking at. If you compare the two sides you can see that the thicker side will be your left side of the heart. Alright so how it works is blood flows in through the superior vena cava as well as the inferior vena cava. This is deoxygenated blood that's come from the brain and from the body. So the blood flows into the right atrium. The blood goes to the right ventricle by flowing through the atrioventricular or the tricuspid valve. Um, then the right ventricle contracts and this pushes blood through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary artery. This is one of the few arteries that carries deoxygenated blood. This artery goes to the right and the left lung. Here blood will get oxygenated and return back to the heart in our pulmonary veins. These are one of the few veins in the body that carries oxygenated blood. Uh, once blood is in the, to, in the uh, left uh, atrium, it'll go through the left atrioventricular or mitral valve into the left ventricle. In the left ventricle, the blood will fill the ventricle and the ventricle will uh, contract. This will send blood 
at really high pressure out into the ascending aorta where the blood will go to the body and to respiring tissues after blood has gone through the body it will return back through the either the inferior or the superior vena cava now coronary heart disease or CHD is a disease that affects the coronary arteries of the heart muscle when these arteries become blocked or uh, become the, the lumen becomes narrowed because of the buildup of plaque then the heart muscle does not get the oxygen supply that it needs and this uh, this is basically coronary heart disease if the coronary arteries are completely blocked this is known as a heart attack factors that increases the risk of coronary artery disease are smoking some uh, bad diet um, lack of exercise stress and certain genes so when we measure our pulse rate uh, we are actually measuring our heart rate indirectly our pulse rate is caused by the expansion and relaxation of our arteries as blood is pushed through them it's important to note that when oxygen demand increases our heart rate will increase as well to deliver this oxygen to muscles now our pacemaker cells which is a patch of muscle cells in the heart actually control the heart rate they do this by sending out an electrical signal uh, over the myocardiocyte which is the muscles of the heart and this electrical signal causes these muscles to contract and this way this little patch of cells actually controls the heart beat by sending out signals or pulses of electrical current here we have our sinoatrial node which contains the pacemaker cells of the heart a signal to increase our heart rate would be when our pH actually decreases um, our muscles produce acidic byproducts and when uh, this acidity causes our pH to decrease our heart will get the signal to increase um, the heart rate and this will increase oxygen flow to the tissues so let's take a look at our blood vessels we have arteries uh, which carry fresh oxygenated blood from the heart to the body when the arteries get to the tissues they start to branch out and form smaller vessels these are known as our capillaries and they've got very thin walls our arteries have very thick um, strong elastic walls uh, to regulate the heartbeat because as the heart beats blood is pushed through and the wall stretches and then it contracts and this evens out our pulse uh, a bit um, now when we look at our capillaries they are branches of our arteries and they are very thin walled vessels and some of them even get that small that only one red blood cell can squeeze through them at a time this allows a very short distance for oxygen to diffuse to the tissues or the cells outside the capillaries so the oxygen will be very close to the cell the tissue because the capillary wall in between is very thin once the blood has gone through the tissue at the end of the capillary bed or network um, these capillaries will start to come together to form one bigger vessel again which is known as a vein and veins do not have as strong elastic walls they have thinner walls but they've got a bigger lumen so that blood can flow easily through back to the heart veins also have um, valves to prevent blood from flowing in the wrong direction uh, that's not allowing blood to flow in this direction study table 9.1 this contains really critical information that you absolutely need to know now let's take a look at blood blood is made up of our plasma our white blood cells and our red blood cells as well as platelets now plasma is the fluid portion of blood uh, it's a liquid with cells suspended in it as well as other dissolved substances such as amino acids red blood cells do not have a nucleus they have a biconcave disc shape which you'll see in the images this increases the surface area of the cell to allow for more a greater oxygen carrying capacity red blood cells contain hemoglobin which is the red pigment that you see it causes the red color and each hemoglobin molecule has iron um, molecules inside it and 
oxygen actually binds to the iron and this way red blood cells transport oxygen. White blood cells on the other hand do have nucleuses and these are often large and low. What's interesting about white blood cells is they can actually migrate out of the blood vessels through little pores or gaps of the blood vessels and they go out of the vessels into tissues to help uh, fight pathogens uh, where they can actually engulf them or they can produce uh, antibodies uh, against these organisms. Platelets are made in the bone marrow and they're actually small fragments of cells. Platelets are critical in blood clotting. Summarize table 9.3, this really brings this section together. So how does a blood clot form? Well, you've got a cut. When there's a cut, uh, platelets will come and aggregate at the site. They will release chemicals um, and the tissue that's been damaged will also release chemicals. These chemicals cause a protein called fibrin to be converted to insoluble fibrinogen. Fibrinogen causes a mesh-like network because it actually traps red blood cells and other platelets in this um, network and this is what actually causes a clot which is sort of like a plug and stops the bleeding. So how is oxygen actually transported in the blood? Well, hemoglobin picks up oxygen and when hemoglobin and oxygen combine at the lungs, they form what's called oxyhemoglobin. This is then transported by being pumped by the heart to the body's respiring tissues. Here, the tissues have a higher affinity for the oxygen than the hemoglobin, so oxygen diffuses to the tissues and oxyhemoglobin becomes hemoglobin again and it can travel back to the lungs to go pick up another oxygen molecule. On the other hand, carbon dioxide is also carried uh, in the blood but it is carried from the tissues to the lungs to be excreted. So carbon dioxide is carried as mostly hydrogen carbonate ions. Some of the carbon dioxide although is actually carried by the hemoglobin molecule as well. So the blood takes this back to the lungs and here we breathe out carbon dioxide. Now let's take a look at how lymph is formed. Our capillaries have tiny gaps in them and these gaps allow for uh, fluid to leak out of the capillaries as well as macrophages as they are able to fit and squeeze through these gaps by changing shape. The fluid then becomes what is known as tissue fluid and this fluid seeps in through the cells. The tissue fluid then collects at open lymphatic ducts or vessels. Lymphatic vessels then carry our lymph back to the subclavian veins where the lymph fluid is put back into circulation into the bloodstream. Alright, well that's all for lesson 9. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Let's take a look at some past papers. Question 18 asks us, the diagram shows a section through the human heart which is the right atrioventricular valve. Here we can clearly see that this side of the heart muscle is a lot thicker and stronger than this side. Thus this must be the left side of the heart as the left side is uh, the larger, more stronger muscular wall. You can see the wall of the left side of the ventricle is much thicker than the right side. So our atrioventricular valve that is the valve between the atrium and the ventricle. The name will tell you where the valve is situated. So these are our atriums and these at the bottom are our ventricles. We also take a look at the right side of the heart. So A here over here must be our atrioventricular valve. Question 17. When blood is flowing through a vena cava, which main blood vessel will it flow through next? So blood flows into the heart, into the right side of the heart via the vena cava. Blood flows in through the superior vena cava as well as the inferior vena cava. So 
which blood vessel, which main blood vessel will it flow through next? So the blood is coming into the heart, it's going into our atrium, it's going to go through the atrioventricular valve into our ventricle and then it's going to exit the heart, oh, the heart via the pulmonary artery. Ventricle contracts and this pushes blood through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary vein. Because the right side of the heart goes to the lungs via the pulmonary artery. That's all for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Good luck with the stunning and go and get those good marks.